Kyle, what are we talking about today? I thought you were going to update us on your uh, with your stock tips again. Yeah, well, I'll save those for later. Bob will ask me a question, I'm sure, about my okay. Zoom for sure. Um, well, first of all, I want to just um, say I appreciate sincerely the leadership of, of Commissioner Sankey and the support and leadership of Chancellor Steinmetz uh, throughout this process. Of, as you guys and I have visited a few times during the summer, and we talked about not rushing into a decision, gathering as much information and data as we could to make a decision that we thought was in the best interest of the student athletes um, here at the University of Arkansas and with it, within the Southeastern Conference. And I believe that we have done that and uh, we have maintained our priority on the health and safety and well-being of our student athletes, our coaches and staff uh, being at the forefront of this consideration. And so um, I just had a chance to meet with our, our football team and our staff. Uh, they're excited now that we have a plan uh, they're excited about the opportunity to play 10 games against Southeastern Conference opponents, and uh, they're just excited to play football. And that's the, that's the reason that we continue to push forward. And I appreciate uh, Coach Pittman's uh, patience uh, throughout this process. I know him uh, more than anybody has been itching to get out on that field as a first-year head coach and have an opportunity to work uh, with his young men and, and compete um, on that field. So. Um, hopefully today pro provide some clarity for all of us on, on at least what football in the Southeastern Conference looks like uh, for the fall of 2020. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for some questions, Kyle. All right. Tom, you want to lead us off? Two questions and, uh, and we'll move on. That would be great. Hey, hon, thanks for doing this again. Um, Thank you, Tom. Yeah, the, um, I know it's not uppermost for you, but the financial repercussions of going to 10, what does that, what does that mean for you guys? And um, uh, what, what do you do with the contracts of, you know, Nevada and ULM games and, and Notre Dame? Sure. Well, I've, I've talked to um, three of the four ADs of our non-conference uh, opponents, and we will work to figure out a solution for, for each of those, whether that's rescheduling the game in the future, what that might uh, look like for us is the decision to go to an all Southeastern Conference schedule was not a financial decision. It was not a decision to save us from paying those guarantees. Um, it was, uh, again, a decision we felt like it gave us the best opportunity to have a football season that was uninterrupted. And Jack Swarbrook and I have uh, missed each other multiple times throughout the day. I I've been busy. He's busy. And so, you know, it would be my hope uh, because I understand that Razorback fans were looking so much forward to going uh, to South Bend, Indiana, to a very historic stadium and, and playing Notre Dame there that we can uh, look at our future football schedules and, and reschedule our game at Notre Dame. Obviously, uh, they're still scheduled to be here in 2025, but I know our fans are very much looking forward to that trip to South Bend. And so I'll work with Jack to see if we can reschedule that visit to South Bend by the Razorbacks in the future. Okay. Uh, two other games that are of utmost importance. The, the A&M game in Arlington and the, the game against Missouri that was scheduled for Arrowhead Stadium, um, are those still on for those venues or what are discussions further to be held on those? Well, you know, our schedule will, will change as far as the dates. The schedule of who we play, those eight SEC games will remain the same. The dates uh, for many of those games we anticipate to change. Whether that impacts the game in Kansas City with Missouri, I haven't heard yet from Jim Sterk officially, but I know it's Texas A&M's desire uh, now with only having five home games with a 10 game schedule to move the game uh, from AT&T Stadium to Kyle Field this year. And we'll continue, Ross and I, to work together with the, the Jones family and the staff at AT&T Stadium to see if we can make that work this year. Okay, thank you. Bob? The other mute button, Bob. Okay, I, I think I'm there. You got me. Yes, got gotcha. you. Okay. Hey, uh, what, what's the plan as far as fans at the games? Do you anticipate fans being able to attend? And if so, what percentage of the stadium would you would that work with? Sure, uh, Bob. We we do anticipate fans uh, to be in Razorback Stadium. We have had continuing conversations uh, with the Arkansas Department of Health and the staff there as we put together our event operations plan. As you look at their uh, current phase two parameters, it says 66% capacity with social distancing. If you follow those guidelines, we'll never get to 66% capacity. We can probably get somewhere closer to 25% capacity with social distancing guidelines. So that plan's continuing to be put together and uh, we're in communication 
uh, with the staff at the Arkansas Department of, Pe of Health, our event operations and staff and facility staff. And so our plan is to have fans in the stands. Um, it won't look like it has looked in the past, but uh, again, if we had to play a game this Saturday, it'd be roughly about 25% capacity. And you said the other day you, you were about 50-50 on if you thought a season would happen. What, where, where are you now, would you say, percentage-wise? I'm about 90-10 that it's going to happen. I think, Bob, this gives us, as we talk to our medical experts uh, throughout the Southeast that have been part of our SEC Medical Task Force, and um, they, they've seen the footprint in which our, our, our schools exist. I think that pushing it back to the 26th of September, having 13 weeks to play 10 conference games gives us the, the best opportunity to play a football season that's uninterrupted. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'll pass the time and Kyle, if you get a chance to swing back, that's great. Thanks. You got it, Bob. Touch. Yeah, Hunter, I was just wondering, uh, does this push back the start of training camp or does it still maybe start on August 7th and you have a little bit of wiggle room now in case, you know, things need to be shut down for any period of time? Sure. Camp will still start on the 7th or practice. It'll look dramatically different from what fall camps have looked like in the past. Our coaches will not be forced to compress, you know, six weeks of um, instruction and practice into three weeks. And so we still plan on starting on the 7th, but that, that will look dramatically different. That won't be you know, the 40, 50, 60 hour weeks that sometimes these coaches and student athletes put in during these couple of weeks of fall camp. It'll be more like a regular week of practice for them. And then with the, uh, the, the fans and stands, uh, is that something that you're, is it kind of like a, a school by school basis? Or are you working with the SEC with that? Or is, is it kind of like, you know, depending on which, which state each school is in? I think you'll see a hybrid in where we work together as Southeastern Conference Institution to have some commonalities around our event operations and those plans. And then of course we all reside in different states. And so we have to follow those guidelines that are established individually by each state's health departments. But so I think you'll see a hybrid where there's some parameters that are put in place that we all collectively um, buy into as Southeastern Conference members. And then there'll be some that'll vary from state to state. Appreciate it, Hunter. Nate? Nate, you're, you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> uh, ah, does that work? Gotcha. There you go. Hunter, as far as the Miami Marlins situation, did that affect any decision with this at all? And, and does it kind of give you some warning signs on what to do or not to do? Um, it did not impact this decision at all. I think it's another educational opportunity uh, with our student athletes and our staff as far as, you know, how things can be, you know, uh, one bad decision can impact many. And so I think it's, it's an educational opportunity for all of us more than anything. Also, have any athletes in any of the sports opted out since you have the option of not of, of retaining their scholarship and not participating? To date, they have not, Nate. Thank you. Trey Biddy. Hey, Hunter. Thanks for doing this. So, do you like the delayed start? Uh, was it was it brought up at all to possibly maybe start on time and then maybe have common bye weeks with all the SEC schools if possible, so you could reschedule games? I think we felt like, based on the, again the, the counsel we received from the medical task force, that um, this was still going to be COVID was still going to be a major issue in the southeast for the next few weeks, and this gave. It's the best opportunity just to push the start back. It also gives us an opportunity for school to start on each of our campuses and for our campus to return to a sense of normalcy as opposed to, you know, campus coming back and then two weeks later we're trying to play our first football game. So I think they were, so as we talked to the presidents and chancellors, it was their desire to try to get campus uh, up and running before we tried to play football games as well. And do you think with the way the schedule works out, do you think that they will – push the divisional games to the front of the schedule, kind of like the Big Ten has done and the cross divisional to the back. And also, how do you think that'll work out? Will it be the next games in the in the SEC rotation or? 
what Mark Womack, who hands it, the football administrator for the Southeastern Conference, what, what he's assured us is he will uh, give us the best scheduling option for the Southeastern Conference. And so what that looks like, I mean, here's the thing. As you know, Trey, we're trying to get 14 athletic directors and 14 coaches to agree on what those additional two games are going to be. That's never going to happen. And so I trust that Mark Womack will do a great job in putting our schedule together. Good luck on that last part. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby? You can write that, that I trust Mark Womack to put a great schedule together. If you can put that in <laughs> Is there a number or a scenario that, that has been discussed if you have so many uh, breakout in your team that that's when you can postpone that game, or, or has that been brought up in specifics? Uh, Bobby, we were, we were trying to get over this first hurdle, um, which was to decide when our season was going to start and how many games you're going to play, and then we will tackle that as we look at next week and in the, in the following weeks, I mean, we roughly have until September 15th or, or so to, to iron all of that plan out. But uh, that's been mildly discussed at a very granular level, and, and we'll get in some, some more details on that and develop what that plan looks like. Has Coach uh, Pittman talked about quarantining certain players, maybe certain position groups, keeping them isolated just in case there is a breakout, so you've got maybe the backup quarterback available if something happens to the starter or anything like that? I, mean, I think the way we're practicing and the way we meet and, and some of the, the things we have changed uh, within our football facility have worked very, very well. And I think he'll continue to do many of those same things as we get into practice really ramping up here in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Hunter. Mike? Um, when this all started back up with those strength and conditioning workouts, there were, at least with some schools, some, some COVID spikes. And we saw two or three of them suspend for a while. And then we started slowly seeing fewer of this and fewer of it. And the reports lately have seemed to be pretty good. Do you think the schools basically adjust, the various football programs adjusted as this went along and made adjustments and, and it's paid off? Absolutely. I think uh, we, we have adjusted and I think our student athletes have adjusted as well. Our student athletes are having to make some uh, very difficult personal decisions that most college students don't want to make. I mean, you know, we all remember our college experiences and uh, some of the best four years of our lives and they're, they're saying, you know, our college students, they want to be out with fellow college students on Dixon Street, um, enjoying what that has to offer. And uh, they're having to make difficult decisions um, to, in difficult sacrifices for football, to make sure that we have a football season and a soccer season and a volleyball season and eventually a men's and women's basketball season. I, I'm so proud of our student athletes and how they have changed uh, what they're doing in their personal lives and how they are making uh, much better decisions. And I think that's what you're seeing more than anything across the country is young men and women making really good choices uh, because they want to play their sports uh, this this fall, this winter, and, and next spring. Now, some fans are already on social media today suggesting that once you transition to actual physical contact workouts, players face-to-face, -face, I, I assume you can't work out that way with masks on, that there's going to be, you're going to see these spikes again, and there's no way to avoid it. Uh, could you talk, address that a little bit, how things would change once you're in an actual August camp type workout? Well, we're getting ready to find that out. And uh, I think that will give us the runway. You know, that September 26th date will also provide us that runway to figure that piece of it out. We, we don't know uh, because nobody has practiced football that way, not, not in the NFL, not in college football, not in high school football. So we're going to learn a lot over the next couple of weeks as we begin to practice. Ty Richardson. Are you mentioning you're pretty proud of the students athletes right now for not choosing to socialize, not going to Dixon street. Do you think that's going to change when a plethora of students end up coming back to campus? I don't. I think our student athletes understand um, what is at stake for them. I think they more than anybody want their fall sports season to happen. And I think they um, have seen as you know, we've had some, of student athletes that have tested positive. We've had others that have been contact tracing, and been in quarantine, and they don't want to, to experience that. And I think they're really doing a great job. And, and look, they're having a social life. We, we've kind of created a social, some social things that we're 
uh, doing for them. We've, we've created some golf nights for them up at Top Golf. We're having movie nights um, over in Bud Walton Arena for them. Uh, we've given them maps to all the hiking and biking trails in the area. We're trying to create social opportunities for them to do some other things that they normally wouldn't do. And they're taking advantage of those things and they're doing them as, as fellow teammates together. And so it's been really cool to see that evolve and happen over the past several weeks. You mentioned that Mark Womack is going to be the one making the SEC schedule, and you mentioned that the eight games you guys already have are going to stay the same. Did he give you guys a timeline on when the other two games are going to be added to the schedule? Yeah, we should have a model here in the next week to 10 days of what our schedule will look like. I mean, what we know is that the four, game, four home games, uh, which was uh, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Alabama, LSU, those games will be at home, and then we'll go on the road. Again, most likely to Kyle Field for Texas A&M, Mississippi State, um, Auburn, and Missouri. And then we'll have two additional games. So you can take uh, the five other teams from the East that we don't play that aren't our crossover games. So that's Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Vanderbilt. And we're going to play one of those five teams at home and the other one at uh, one of those other five teams um, on the road. Thanks, Hunter. John Neighbors. Yeah, I was just curious about, uh, you know, with a lot of the stories going on with the ACC and getting their announcement yesterday, do you know of how much of an influence or any sort of working together that the SEC and the ACC had? And looking at the ACC format, was that ever on the table of having an all-conference schedule but then adding a non-conference game similar to what they did? Well, we've had various scheduling models uh, on the table, whether it was the full 12 game schedule, an eight conference game plus two non conference games, the 10 non conference games. We, we looked at various models, and again, we felt like this model was the one that gave us the best opportunity to, uh, to have a full or almost a full football season. So I won't say what another conference did or did not do influenced uh, the, the decisions that we made in the Southeastern Conference. All right, and finally, uh, the real important question. I know that uh, you know capacity is going to be next on the table, but is uh, is the tailgating side of things going to be mentioned and talked about as far as for fans and uh, participating in the event around the stadium on game days? Yeah, still to be determined. Um, obviously, if there's tailgating, it's going to look dramatically different than what tailgating has been. College football is going to look dramatically different than it has ever looked. And, and if you're going to come to a college football game, this year, wherever you're coming, you're just going to have to accept that it's not going to be the same college football atmosphere that we have all uh, come to love, especially in the Southeastern Conference. It's going to be dramatically different. All right. Fingers crossed. Appreciate it, Hunter. Kyle Deckelbaum. Yeah, Hunter, you touched on this a little bit, but just how contentious are some of these um, discussions trying to get 14 voices uh, to agree on something where there's really no correct answer, no correct plan here? You know, Commissioner Sankey's done a great job keeping that from happening for the most part. I, I would say that um, we, we all had one goal and we wanted to have a fall sports season. We felt like we've got to have a fall sports season before we can have basketball and gymnastics and swimming and all those sports. And so uh, we had one goal. We're all working together towards achieving that goal. And I think we have done that. So um, the conversations have not been contentious. And I think if we started to try to decide who those other two games are going to be collectively, now that's going to get contentious. And I think that's why Mark Womack is going to give us the best option um, so we can just. What did Sam Pittman think when you, you know, sort of broke the news to him that he will play 10 SEC games in his first year? Well, I think he, Kyle, he's relishing that opportunity to play 10 SEC games um, in his first year as a head coach. Um, you know what, uh, Coach Pittman just wants to play coach football. I and mean, he wants those young people to have an opportunity to play football. And um, look, we had Notre Dame on the schedule. We're going to replace Notre Dame with, with an SEC opponent, probably somewhat equitable. Um, so, you know, we had nine really tough games on our schedule and three additional games. And so you've got a lot to play the games. And we'll, we'll play whatever 10 games uh, are put on our schedule. And um, I know that our – our student athletes having just covered that with them. They're really excited about that opportunity to play 10 games. Thanks, Art. Hayden. Hey, Kyle. Uh, Hunter, appreciate it. Um, sorry if you already mentioned this. I've uh, been kind of in and out. Um, Missouri, I think I saw a report where Missouri said that game will likely be in Columbia. I didn't know if you had an update on that one. Um, I think with the, the, the it most likely will be a date change. Um, and I think with uh, just in general, the, 
the NFL venues and what they're each going through this year and their, their own NFL season, I think it's not – I think you, you will see that game that will be moved back to Columbia. Gotcha. And uh, last one really quick. I know you mentioned you spoke to the team just a short while ago. Really interested if there was any guys who, who knew that this was going to be their last opportunity, seniors who didn't have another year or had to move on after this, just their reaction knowing that their chances of being able to play another year or maybe their final year of college football uh, was good now. I'm sure a lot of positive reaction. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have an opportunity to have any individual conversations, but you, you could see some relief and, um, and a, a weight lifted off their shoulders because it, there's a plan now. Um, and having a plan gives them a sense, okay, we know that we've got a target date that we're going to start on September the 26th. Again, fall camps can look, look a little bit differently, but I think just having a plan in place uh, helps them give them something to focus on and, and remove some of the anxiety from potentially the season being canceled. Thanks, Hunter. Appreciate it. Carlos, did you have a question? Carlos, you're muted. Oh, yeah. You hear me there? All right. Hunter, with, uh, with soccer not being uh, allowed to play in the state of Arkansas and with the first three games of, of, of the Ladybacks uh, being pushed, how much does that affect that program where, where Coach Colby has been tremendous and having a great season in, in, in the last two years? How much does that affect if for some reason soccer won't be allowed here in the state? Uh, so soccer will be allowed here in the state. We're going to be permitted to play soccer and volleyball and run cross country, and we're going to have a full fall sports season. We're not just going to play football. We will play women's soccer. We will play volleyball. And we'll play, it will run cross country meets. Uh, we, we'll start focusing on what those seasons look like next week as athletic directors and, and have a plan uh, that we'll put in front uh, of our coaches and then move forward. Uh, we will have a soccer season. Thank you. Matt at KRK. Okay. Uh, all right, let's get going back uh, back around the horn. If you've got questions uh, and you already haven't told me, please let me know in the chat. Tom, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Hey, Hunter. Um, so the football team and staff had zero positive tests that were on Wednesday. Uh, you still have anybody in quarantine, and when would the next round of testing take place? Um, we will start a weekly testing protocol as we move into practice. Um, for all of our fall sports. And so we, we will have testing for our soccer and volleyball teams that will take place on Friday. And then football will begin testing every week as well as all of our, our fall sports as they move into their practice practices and then competitive seasons. And then did, were there any football guys in quarantine still? I don't have my list in front of me. I think we have uh, two football players that are currently in quarantine, yes. Okay, and you know, fall uh, golf has a fall season as well. Is that still on track? That will be something we will discuss as athletic directors. You may have seen the ACC. Uh, I think they have allowed their tennis and golfers to play unattached fall seasons. Uh, that that would not be my desire um, in the Southeastern Conference, and we're going to try to see if we can have a, a fall golf season because that leads to their spring rankings. Um, and we'll address what the non-traditional fall sports such as golf and tennis, baseball and softball look like as well. I mean, obviously we've got a number of decisions still to be made moving forward. We, we've, we've got football, at least a plan in place for them. We've got to establish what that schedule looks like. We've got to work on soccer and volleyball and cross country, and then we'll get to those non-traditional spring sports as well. I'm guessing you already have a model for what the revenues might look like. Uh, what do you anticipate this will, this, effect, this will have as an effect on your, on your revenues? Well, Tom, you know, if our attendance is 25%, you take that season ticket number of roughly 33,000. I think we're maybe a little bit north or south of 33,000 season tickets sold. I don't have that number right in front of me. But um, if we can put a fraction of those uh, fans in our stands, I mean, that's going to have a significant impact on our revenue this year. Trey Schapp. Hunter, obviously, um, if you could send an email to Mark Womack and say, here are the two schools that we would like to play this year, what two would those be? Oh, you can't put me on the spot like that, Trey. 
I'm going to make an SEC coach or athletic director mad. Uh, we'll, we'll play any of them. You, you pick the ones you think we should play. They're, we're, they're probably the same. Okay, and then obviously if the A&M game has moved to Kyle Field this year, would you want that game in Fayetteville next year before going back to Arlington? It, we'll have that discussion, Ross and I, as well as the Jones family and the folks at AT&T Stadium to see what makes sense uh, with that series. But, um, I mean, obviously you would say that that would probably be the fair and equitable thing to do, but we'll see what that looks like moving forward. I'm just worried about playing this year right now. Thanks. Bob? There you go. Hey, Hunter, um, I know you don't want to say who you'd like to play, but seriously, can, can you, you know, talk to Mark and say, look, man, we're not Alabama. You got to help us out here. You know, I mean, can you, do you think they'll work with you and be logical about matchups? Hey, Bob, I, I have reminded Mark Womack the last time we won a Southeastern Conference game. How's that? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I always, it was an old this. Yeah, I remember, okay, I think. It wasn't uh, recently. And then your, your discussions with the, the non-conference ADs, I mean, uh, some of these things are going to, you can tell at some schools they might get contentious about whether or not they owe a guarantee. Um, do you feel good that, that it'll be, you guys will be agreeable to either scheduling or, hey, if you got to pay a percentage of the guarantee, or, or do you feel good that your contracts are such that, hey, with a pandemic, we, we're not going to owe you those guarantees? Well, you know, I think our language in our contract is, is, is really good. Um, it was written well uh, by our legal counsel, and, it, and I think it protects us in this event, especially the expanded um, conference schedule like we have it. But um, we're, we're all colleagues in this industry, and I want to work with my fellow athletic directors to make sure that we have an am amicable solution. That's why it's very important to me, and I'm sure many of my colleagues did as well in the Southeastern Conference. It was important for me to reach out to each athletic director and, and have that conversation before this became official. And we've been communicating throughout the summer, so I don't think it was a, a complete surprise to any of them when, when I reached out to them. And, and I know you said, um, or I guess every, I think most teams are going to be able to have that August 7th start date or whatever. But for a new staff that didn't get to have any spring ball, how important do you think that extra time is for, for Sam and his guys? Bob, it's huge. It, it really is like it's a weekend. Really take what we missed in the spring and, and kind of funnel that into these next uh, three or four weeks and, and allow uh, Sam and his staff not to feel so rushed to put so many things in if we were going to start on September 5th. So this is really a blessing for our football program, having a new staff and uh, for Sam and his staff to, to really uh, take their time uh, putting their systems in and evaluating the players on the field. I said one more if I could. You, you, sure. you, said, you said you're about 90% feeling good. How good does it feel to say 90% for you? It feels, it feels great, Bob. It, it really does um, to have a plan. And I feel like as we talk to our medical professionals, we're going to have a window to play football safely this year. And, and that's what really feels good now that we have a plan in place. And look, you guys have followed this virus as much as I have since March the 11th. Um, it changes on a regular basis um, and this plan could change. But right now I feel really good about the advice and the counsel and, and what the models are showing and that this is a great opportunity for us to play college football this year. Okay, well, if you got any stock tips, just, just shoot me an email. I will, I will, Bob. Zoom's down a little bit this week, I think. Yeah. I don't know why. Not like I've stopped being on Zoom. <laughs> Jordan Black. Jordan. Jordan or Mitch. Nikki, you've been quiet. No questions today. Question if Kyle wants to call on me. <laughs> Just You're not up, super Nikki. I, all right. Um, Hunter, have you heard anything about recruiting and if they're making any progress towards allowing kids to come to campus? I know it's complicated, but maybe if testing could be arranged, I don't know. Have you heard anything? I think you will see that again, this is what I think, Nikki. I think you will see de the dead period extended through the end of the calendar year. I don't see recruiting opening up. Um, any time during football season. Um, and then also with the 
players who choose to opt out, I know they remain in good standing, but do they keep their eligibility for that year if they have a red shirt available or just in general, like would they have to apply to, you know, forgive that year they missed? Sure. You know, that, that was an NCAA um, proposal that was supported by all 14 institutions. And so if you have a red shirt year and you decide to sit out this year, you can use that red shirt year, but that was not an NCAA proposal. So there's not a guarantee that a waiver would be approved gotcha. uh, for you to gain that year back um, if you did not have a red shirt year. Okay, thank you. Hutch, did you have one? Yes, just as a follow-up to Nikki's question with recruiting, if the dead period is extended, do you envision the, the early signing period still happening when it's currently scheduled or could that just be completely eliminated? I think, again, Andrew, I think if the dead period is extended through December, you will see the early signing period uh, moved uh, past the first of the year. Thank you. All right, let's try this again. Jordan Black. Okay, I'm ready. Sorry, I had to get headphones. Um, I'm curious what the conversation was like amongst athletic directors when it came to the rivalry games. I know this doesn't affect Arkansas, but just talking about not doing that non-conference plus one game for places like Florida and Florida State, Georgia, Georgia Tech, what was that conversation like? It, it was a hard conversation for those athletic directors. Obviously, uh, those are some storied rivalry games that are played on an annual basis for, for several consecutive years, but we're members of the Southeastern Conference, and it was the best decision for our 14 conference member institutions for those games not to be played this year. So, the, the, Jordan, those are very difficult conversations for those athletic directors. Uh, but again, they fully supported uh, moving forward without playing those games. Thanks. Uh, we got time for one more. John Neighbors, the honor is yours. Oh man, this is big time. Uh, Hunter, I just, uh, I wanted to ask, cause I know this has been kind of floated around uh, mainly just social media, but if this season goes really well in, in the SEC with the 10 game schedule, uh, could you see a possibility of maybe in future seasons having an actual 10 game SEC schedule instead of just the normal eight one that we have right now? No. How's that? For an Perfect. That's so, going to wrap us up. Well, that, we, I think we have one more question here for Mike. He can uh, – Go ahead, Mike. Um, you touched on this briefly, but about baseball. Uh, Dave Van Horn, right after the season was pretty uh, – ended abruptly, he said that he was hopeful in the fall there might be a chance to play more exhibition games than are currently allowed, that they needed some kind of a way to kind of get these guys back into playing mode. And he saw that as a way to do that. Would you try to address that at all uh, when you deal with what, what baseball does in the fall? They might play more than a normal load of exhibition games. Mike, I, I don't foresee that happening right now. I, mean, I just think there's so much going on um, within our departments and, and we're managing so many different things. I don't see us adding uh, more events like fall baseball games to, uh, to the schedule. I, I don't foresee that happening. I'll never say never. Um, and, and quite honestly, uh, Dave and I have not, he's not mentioned that to me as, but um, I, I don't foresee that happening. We're, we're doing everything we can to play football, soccer, volleyball, cross country, and get men's women's basketball season started up on time. I don't foresee us uh, putting any additional non-traditional season events like they're like baseball scrimmages. Would that mean maybe eliminating the two you normally play? I think you could see that happening. I'm not going to – we have – to be honest, we have not discussed that. Again, I'll tell you what I think. I think that's a great possibility that that would happen. All right. Uh, appreciate everybody jumping on here. Short, no short notice. Uh, Hunter, thank you for your time. We, uh, we will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Hunter.